Well, good morning, and thank you for, sorry, I like rush that. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Okay, it's great to be here, it really is. Um, so thank you for the, the uh, invitation. So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Mark, Mark Miller, married to Maureen. Uh, we live in um, Newcomerstown, Ohio, uh, 10 Cross Point Mennonite there in Baltic. Have four children, um, oldest is 20, youngest is seven. So um, we're where I kind of think a lot of you guys are, just kind of this, the, our, our church is also a fairly young church. Uh, looks like you guys are kind of the same shoes there. Uh, love to see this. We have our churches, uh, we just went through a church plant, and so we're down to about 100 people Sunday mornings, and so this feels good, it feels really nice here. So I, um, I recognize that you just came from a Love and Respect seminar uh, over the last several days, and so Nate's words were, um, we're, we're doing a marriage retreat, but it's a Sunday morning, so there'll be other people there as well. So, so we'll see what we can do to pull all of us in. I think we can, we can go there. My, my, my inspiration, motivation, my I am, is simply I want you to realize that a great marriage is based on common vision and mission for the kingdom, uh, not an end in and of itself. And I think that's one of the things that, that maybe Emerson would hint at. Uh, in the, especially the last session, but I'd like to really expand that and really speak into that part of it. As I look across the audience today, I see, and I don't know you very well, uh, I know different pieces uh, and different people here, um, but I do see a group of people that have been blessed with many gifts. We live in an era, at the very least, we live in the era of history that is unprecedented in the Western world when it comes to personal comfort and wealth by any standard. Um, most of us are part of a stable nuclear family. We hold family security in high regards, and we should. We also have, uh, as Anabaptist people, have tremendous strength, and I'm very grateful for those. I really am. We have salvation, and we're in little danger of losing our salvation. Uh, for the most part, I mean, we have we have the potential for every, just like everyone else. But the things we struggle with are seldom the salvation part of what we've got. But one of the burdens of my heart is the gifts that we've been given, the talents, the advantages. They were never intended for us to be the consumers of those. Those were gifts that we've been given so we could bless the rest of the world and the rest of the people. And I see that too often we focus on these gifts and we take them in and we, we think that we need to have great marriages, we need to have great churches, and we do, but to what purpose? If there's not something bigger behind this, if there's not something bigger behind the purpose of our marriage, of our churches, then, then it's all pointless. It really is. And there's a lot of very happy marriages out there. Churches that are conflict-free, but they have very little to offer people because they're really not uh, giving others. Understand that you've went through the love and respect. I, I like that series. We went through it. I think the first time we went through it as a married couple were, boy, I don't think we had any children, so it was 19, well, 20 years ago for sure. Um, and, and then we've had it at church sometimes. And so I, I would like to push into some things here. And, I, and, and working on ways to better your marriage, you, you have chosen an assignment that is old. It's an old assignment. It's, it's actually older or just as old as the hills. Um, and I mean that in reality. It was in the first week of creation that God created Adam. I'm going to go to Genesis 2, and I promise for those of you that aren't married that I'll expand this. It's not just for marriage. But in Genesis 2, 18 to 25, I'm going to read this, and I read most of mine will be in the ESV this morning, uh, but um, I will read this. And so we want to focus on, on this passage, and then we'll just we'll keep going here. There are different passages I want to go to, but it just simply says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatsoever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helper fit for him. 
So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. This is often read at weddings, and um, it's good that it is. But it begins with two humans, not some superhero standing all by himself. Two people, a relationship, a marriage, a man and a woman, given to one another at the beginning of time. The human race is about to begin a great adventure, a great struggle. And so marriage must play some essential part in this big story, the beginning of the world. We see that. Now let's go way back to the end of the world. Way in the end, Revelation 21, verse 2. After um, the horse, the second ride, uh, coming, the white horse and its rider appear. Creation and the world as we know it is over. It ceased to exist. Time is no more. And in Revelation 21, 1 and 2, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The Bible starts with and ends with a marriage. This is a story of God, and this, this whole book is a story of God creating us, pursuing us. What, what would cause a God to create us knowing that we're going to reject him, but he does it anyway. And he knows that he's not only going, we're not only going to reject him, he's going to send his son or part of himself, like uh, a part of himself, we can, we, the language we have to use is his son or something that we can get. He sends him to us, we reject him, he kills us, kills him. He does it anyway. That's a, that's a love, that's a suffering love. And that, that, that is exemplified in marriage. We, we've talked about that earlier this morning about love. One of the scariest things, and, and uh, I think the, the heart of God is, is that, that opening himself and making himself vulnerable. One of the scariest things for a woman, for her to do is to offer up her heart, open her heart to a man and believe that she's worth pursuing after. It's an incredibly vulnerable spot, but she needs to do it for her marriage to be successful. And not once, but again and again and again. To offer her beauty, not knowing whether it's enough. In the same way, it's scary for a man to offer his strength without knowing how things will turn out. To put himself out there and being afraid of maybe it's not enough. Maybe I don't have enough. So we'll struggle. We struggle in this. But it's not about us. It really isn't. We have an enemy that's committed to wreck the relationships we're at because it's so dear to the heart of God. But why is it such a big deal? We live in a, we're broken people in a broken world. We shouldn't be surprised that relationships are hard. But way too often, we don't see the big picture. We get tempted to make small adjustments here. We make small adjustments there. We go to love and respect seminars. We go to caring for the heart seminars. We, we fix these things, and I get it. We need to. But until we understand the underlying principle that we have an enemy that is committed to wrecking these relationships, it's as futile as changing and rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. It's going to sink, and we try to make it look better as it sinks. But God is love. He's pursuing us with an incredible love. We are created in God's image. You'll notice that we as humans are above all profoundly relational because he is. God is a passionate, jealous lover, and out of that love, he created us for love. Think about the two great commandments, and we'll go back to these again. But um, when the lawyer came to Jesus, he said, um, what are the two greatest commandments, or what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus quoted the Shema to him, you know, the, the, that Jewish uh, saying that all Jews, even today, say every morning when they wake up, every evening before they go to bed, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Second is like unto this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We get the idea that God cares about love. He cares about this as a motivation. Love is central to the story. We're urged to love, commanded to love, implored to love over and over again. So why is it such a big deal? It's because what is at stake? 
we'll keep going here in the story here. It wasn't long after creation till the utopia of the Garden of Eden was broken. Adam and Eve, it doesn't, I don't know if they were still on their honeymoon, but it, they didn't have children. So it was very early in their relationship that the devil comes sneaking in to attack and to destroy. And he does the same for us. He will, he will get us to attempt to doubt each other's motives. He will try to get you to make an idol of your marriage. And that, I think, is what I want to speak about this morning. That first we need to know that he is, he is out to destroy us. I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. I'm going to talk here. Here it talks about companionship. And we're going to go into this and then, then we'll kind of pivot here and talk about the, the main part of the, the sermon here. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, this is talking about companionship. This is, this is also is often used in a marriage. Um, it's interesting, this is actually in context, this is not speaking about marriage in this passage, but it is good to know, and it's, it's actually really good to understand here. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12 says, Two are better than one because you have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his brother or his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he is not another to help him up. And again, if two lie together, they have heat. And how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. This has the context of companionship. I know this is not primarily talking about marriage, but I think we can apply. And I want to go back to World War II, back to the foxholes. You know, the soldiers spend a tremendous amount of time in the foxholes, and they realize that they fought much better if there were at least two in that foxhole. And they, after the war, they would get together in the reunions, and they would talk about the companionship and the connections they had in those foxholes. They, they ate in there. They slept in there. They, they huddled together for warmth when it was below zero, when the artillery was falling down upon them. But companionship wasn't the goal it really wasn't they 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 come out of there they made great friends but that wasn't the point of the war the army realized that men fought better when they were not alone but they had a bigger cause they weren't together for the companionship they were in the middle of a fight to control europe and they were in the middle of a fight for a very very different ideology Want to? I'm often always cautious to take a bite of uh, bite, uh, illustrations from from the military, but I think this is a point that we can get together here and understand here. What drove these men closer together? It's because they were united in something bigger than that little foxhole. And I think so often we get into our marriages, into our relationships, and we think that the the marriage is the problem or it's the answer, and it's a part of the big fight that we're really fighting. Our marriages should be base camp for assaulting Mount Everest. But we have to have something bigger than just our marriages. But before they jumped off on D-Day, there was an order of the day that went out from Dwight Eisenhower. I'm going to read part of it. It says, soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied expect expeditionary force. You are about to embark on the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty, loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies, brothers in arms, our other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for yourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. He goes on and talks about the progress they made earlier and that victory was in sight. But many, many people went to their deaths, but they were united because they had something bigger than just the companionship that they were trying. That came out of it, but they're, they're united, the, they were united in vision. The, the connection of their companies wasn't a part of it, but they did fight better in companies. Our marriages like that, they will be under attack. We need good marriages. We need good fr- uh, families, but they dare not become our idols. What I mean by that is that can't be the goal. Your, your goal can't be to have a good family because then you'll really have success. There are a lot of happy Families that don't have anything bigger going on. And we have to have a bigger goal. We are in a fight for a much bigger cause. We want good families. We want good marriages. 
but the enemy realizes that when you have a home that is God-fearing and God-honoring, then you're welding offensive weapons against him. The heart of a man wants a great battle to fight, adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. The heart of a woman longs for someone to fight for her, to play a part in that great adventure, and to offer beauty, to be rescued. We want to fight some good, great battle together. And if we can't fight a great battle, then we try and look inward, and we start fighting among ourselves just to satisfy that urge to, for conflict. I fear sometimes we look at our marriages kind of like we can look at our churches. I'm going to go to Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. Paul is speaking here in these verses, prior to the, uh, verses about the need for to be united in church. He talks about the need to be connected to each other. He talks about the need to interact. But then in verse 12, in 11 and 12, and he says, they gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Here he gives the gifts, speaking about the, the fivefold um, ministry gifts. And he gave them to the church. And listen to verse 12. It says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. According to this verse, what is the reason for giving these gifts to the church? Why does he give these gifts to the church? Look closely there in verse 12. Exactly. Out from others. To equip the saints to do ministry. We sometimes think that the gifts are given to the church so we can be a really good church. And that's good, all right? But we are here so we can do ministry. Ministry, it's, some of it happens here today. But more of it happens when you're gone, when you're, split, when, you're all away, when you're throughout the week. Paul is saying that the church is given gifted men so they can equip the church or the saints for the work of ministry. They're not to do the ministry themselves, all of it. It says we are to equip their saints. You see, ministry happens out there. Church is a place to come to get charged to so we can fulfill the ministry of the church. And the church is not to be the focus of the work in and of itself. It's not to become a consumer of the gifts. We're to give, use those gifts to bless others. America is full of churches that are inwardly focused. And we see that we are more obsessed uh, as a nation uh, by ourselves. More narcissistic culture than we've ever been. They feel to, fail to see that the church is the bride of Christ. And as such, we are to focus on him and not the church. And in the same way, a loving marriage, a happy marriage, it is not enough to hope as Christians that, we, that this is all we need. We want something bigger, something bigger and deeper going on here. Going to, in, in Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 23, Paul is talking about the need for wives to submit and for husbands to love. Uh, we talked about the, the love and respect. He goes on and talks about how great marriages are like Christ and the church. We're going to break in in verse 31 here in Ephesians 5. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. He said this is a big mystery. But he says, and I am saying that refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respect her husband. This is a whole passage where you get the whole love and respect. So it's, it's the marriage is, supposed, is, is, is exemplifying or example of the church, not the other way around. We see we, we miss it sometimes. The mystery is Christ and the church. Your marriage is a picture of something much bigger than yourself. There are hundreds of books on marriage out there. Most of them talk about connection, communications, or some other way to improve the relationship between husband and wife, and that's really, really good. We as Christians should have the best marriages. We really should. We should have the best homes. We should have places that we can connect with as we seek to build the kingdom, but they are not an end in themselves. We have to have something bigger going on. As we look at the Bible, there's a story here. It talks about marriage a lot, but there's a story. It's always in the context of doing something bigger. You think of the Bible, you think of back in creation, then you have the fall, then you have the story of redemption and God's bringing everybody together and it's after redemption, he's redeeming us so he can restore us and we're in that conflict of redemption and restoring and he calls us to be a part of that same mission. We're in the process of being redeemed and our marriages should reflect this principle. God calls us to have good marriages. He's calling us to have marriages that glorify him. But nowhere... Do I see that our marriages should become the focus or the end of itself? They're to be good so we can carry out God's plan for our lives. They're not to become idols. If we were to take the Bible 
go to the Bible, New Testament especially, and you talk about, look at, do a survey of, of Christ's teachings on marriage, family. It's not what we like to think. It's actually incredibly scary. If you look at it, um, I think we'll be shocked. It's interesting what he says. In Luke 16 is one, for instance, he said to have the story of the man that made a great supper and he invited many people to come to it. And he, the, as soon as he started doing that, he, in, excuses started to come in. First one was, I bought a piece of property. The next one was, I, I started a business or I bought a yoke of oxen. The third one is, I've married a wife. And he doesn't make a difference between the person that said he married a wife or the person that said that he's involved in business. He's saying the kingdom of God is bigger than our businesses. It's bigger than the real estate deal you're doing, but it's also bigger than your marriage. Jesus didn't make any difference. He goes on and he says, now great multitudes, in verse 25, same chapter, great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yet his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. How many times have we heard people make excuses for doing ministry because it would hurt their family? And I want to be very cautious here. Here in my heart. And single, when they were single, they go on mission trips. And I bless the singles. Uh, and then they start dating. They start having babies. And that's fantastic. But we, we, we just hear this. We want to focus on our relationship. We want to focus on our marriage. It doesn't change. They want to spend a lot of time together. And that's, I bless you. But it's hard to find people willing to come to church and push the work of the kingdom out. We need people that have a vision that's much bigger than just ourselves. They want to spend a lot of time together. And because they do, they have children. They get pregnant. And then it's toddlers. And then it's teens. And it's never a good time to do ministry. Because, because life happens. And then when are you going to do it? So when you're empty nesters, now you have time for the kingdom. We've got to do better than spare change and spare time if we want the kingdom of God to go forward. There's got to be a better way. What did Jesus say in the light of this text? He says, if we don't love him more than our family, than even our wife and children, we cannot be his disciples. The love we have for our family, for our kids, our spouse, our family must be lost in our love for Christ. Our love for Christ doesn't diminish our love for our family, but it's lost inside of it. It's in that context. Love for your family and wife must not be priority, but it must be lost in a deeper love for Christ that consumes us. That means that at times we'll make decisions that will be uncomfortable and hard for our children. It will put, place them in a position where they see that we love God more than them. And that is incredible security. You know the saying that you, the best thing you can do for your kids is to love their mother? That's I agree with that. The best thing you can do for your kids is to love their God. And let him consume you with the heart for the kingdom of God. They will see your passion and it will come through. It doesn't mean you neglect the relationship, but it means that that relationship is in the context of the kingdom of God. And it's something bigger. They will get it. Do ministry with them. We are gods and we live our lives for the kingdom. Our hope is not for this life. The 1 Corinthians 7, 29, I want you to turn to this one. This is a key passage here, and we very seldom use this passage in the context of marriage. It's, and I know why. It's scary, all right? It doesn't feel good. But I think I want to read it here, and I really want to focus on what, we're, what Paul's trying to say here. Paul is talking to the Corinthians and um, we know that he, he's talking to them. He's trying to get them to uh, figure out. And here's his, this is some, sometimes marriage advice from Paul is kind of hard uh, because he says some hard things. And then he says that passage where he talks about marriage and said, you should all be unmarried. And then he says, I, you know, I'm speaking of my own, but I think I have the spirit. And, you know, but it is, it's in the Bible, guys. And we need to take it as that. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 35 says, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has gone very short. And so he's given context here. The appointed time, this is after the resurrection. So the time we have, it's very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as, they, as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though had no dealings at all with it. 
for the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. I think this is why he's saying this. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried and betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. For I say this for your own benefit, not to lay restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That last phrase is key here. To secure your undivided devotion devotion to the Lord. This is Paul. This is the one that said you should love your wives. This is the one that said you should reverence or respect your husband. But listen to him. In verse 29, he said, those that are married live as though they were not. Now, there's a lot of people in our society that are living like they're not married. That's not that kind of, and that's in a very sinful way. That's not the point. Paul is saying, as it relates to the kingdom of God, live in a way that your, your wife or your children or your family is not a, it's not taking it's not becoming an idol. It is actually, and we can do that in a way that's very positive. It doesn't make sense to us. I, there's, there's this, um, how many of you guys are familiar with The Amazing Race? Okay, so it's a, it's a TV show. Um, that what they do is they race around the world in teams of two people. And so what they'll do is they'll start out, race around the world, and have these pit stops all over the world. They go in teams of two. Okay, so... It's in, in pairs, sometimes it's husband, wife, sometimes it's siblings, sometimes it's two friends. But it's, it's a race around the world for a million dollars. And it's, it, it's actually very interesting. It starts out with, I think, 10 or 12 teams. And each leg, each segment, one team gets eliminated. Last person to come in to the mat gets eliminated, all right? And so they have a lot of different challenges, hard challenges. They come up against roadblocks that are thrown in there on purpose, hard things they have to work through. So you can imagine two people in a race, around the world, cultures, you don't understand each other. Talk about working through relationship challenges. They do. They have to. They, they put the hammer down as they go around. They focus on completing the challenges. When there's work to do, there's some tasks that are dependent on teamwork. They get to a checkpoint. They're so relieved. You can see they get to a checkpoint. They're not the last ones there. They hear him say, look, congratulations, you're team number two or one or whatever. But they're not the last ones. They high-five each other, and it's, it's a really good, they love it. But the reality is next day they have to go right back out on that race. And if they're not getting along with the person they're in the race with, they're in trouble. And you can see this. If the race, if the, day one or two, first couple episodes, if you can see if there's a team that's fighting, they're not going to make it. Because they can't even agree who goes first on a challenge. They're, they're so busy fighting that they can't, they'll never win the race. There's so many analogies here. But in the Christian life, we're in a race too. And we're in a race for much more than a million dollars. We're in a race that, that is, is incredible. Paul says that, we should, we should, that we're in a race. He says we need to throw off the sin that entangles. We need to keep going because we have a goal that's much bigger than us. When we get to the end, it won't be a million dollars. It'll be this, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's our goal. And if we live our lives with that kind of focus, we will have better marriages. We will have relationships that are focused on building the kingdom of God. And as a result, our marriages will be better. Our families will be better. We will be mission focused. These teams that they fight, they bicker, they fall behind, they get eliminated because they're not focused on the goals. And they, they, those, they, they grow together and closer because of the challenges. There's a point to your marriage, but it's more than just a happy marriage. It needs to be bigger than just that. There's a point to any relationship that we have. It has to be bigger than that. It's, it's, like, it's like if you have a, well, we'll get to that later. The goal is to be united for the kingdom, and results will be a good marriage. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 and 7, Paul is saying, For I am already po being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, with the, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. If we can live our life like that, it will make a difference. We will have the best marriages. If I can look at Maureen and visualize her standing before God someday, that will make a difference in how I relate. 
that will, re, that will make a huge difference in how we interact with each other. As we go through challenges and struggles, we'll recognize that they're not coming from her. They're not, the, the challenges are from the devil trying to get in between us because he doesn't want us to get to the kingdom of God. He doesn't want us to get to the judgment seat and be okay. There's a war going on. The goal of our marriages is no longer becoming that of having a marriage that is free from, con free from conflict, but is a side benefit. That the free from conflict will be a side benefit of being kingdom focused. There's a lot of marriages that are happy. They're conflict free, free and they're pointless. Francis Chan calls them happy and worthless marriages. Uh, and that's a little, maybe a little strong here, but, but I, we, I, we get his point. There are people that are happy and they've got good marriages, but they're, they're really not, they're not giving back to society. There's a war going on. And instead of raising our soldiers to fight, our kids for the soldiers, we want to stay in our gated communities with our bike helmets on and just be safe. When you work together for a goal, you will have the best marriages. We know this, going short-term mission trips, when is the best time? It's not on the bus trip to New York or even on New York on the streets. It's actually on the bus trip back home. We, we, mission focus, we, we draw together tremendously. We live in a very narcissistic world. We see people focus on themselves very, far too much. But this is actually true in our marriages as well. 2 Timothy 3, verse 2 talks about the fact that in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. We live in a culture that is obsessed with themselves. Take more selfies now than anything else. What pleases me? What happens? I want people to, to satisfy me. Entire business models built around social media content uh, for individual people. I'm not talking about business. I'm talking about individual people. We live in an age that has been so inward focused, yet we have more failed marriages than ever before. We have more depressed people than ever before, and I think there's a, there's a connection. Husbands, do you know how to love your wife well? Love God more than her. Lead your home in a way that is Christ-centered. Keep your family on mission, a mission that is much bigger than the two of you, a mission that you actually cannot accomplish alone. We're broken people. We're full of sin and self. If we love God, we will see that God is bigger and better than this world. And as we lead our families in a way that emphasizes the mission, we will come up with difficult problems. We'll come up against them. We'll need to work through the selfishness, and we need to communicate well, and we'll be able to do projects together that energize us. But where there is sin, where there is pride, where there is fear, we'll work through those, put those to death, and the result will be a, a people connected to God. I'm reminded of, of, of John Piper's quote. He said, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. And that's the deepest part of us that needs that. That's what's going to fulfill the deepest desires of your wife's heart. When we find fulfillment in God, not in each other, then we're ready for service. Those, those of you that aren't married, those of you that are most ready for marriage are those that need it the least. Several years into our marriage, Maureen was going through a Bible study, and it was, it was life-changing for us. I wasn't, she's panicking now because she doesn't know I'm going to say this. She doesn't know what I'm going to say, right? There, there's nothing more vulnerable. No, there is a lot. There, it's always scary to, to, talk a, to, to preach a message at a wedding or a marriage seminar because your wife's in the audience, right? Um, I think it was a Beth Moore Bible study. And um, don't throw us under the bus for a Beth Moore Bible study. Um, but it was a Beth Moore Bible study. And going through that Bible study, we discovered something that made us much healthier as a married couple. I came home from work one day, and Maureen said, Mark, you're not responsible for my happiness. I'm like, oh, cool, this is good. <laughs> but, but she goes on and says, if I'm not satisfied in God, if I'm not looking to him to satisfy my deepest longing, then I put unreal expectations on our marriage, and it hurts us. And that has been incredible of a blessing, of incredible blessing to us as a couple, as we understand that. Not that I don't want Marine to be happy. I want her to be happy. But because she gets her happiness from God, I get my happiness from God, fulfillment from God, we together can then have enough energy to help other people. Because we're not so focused on making sure that we're okay. And there's times when it's like we're probably not okay, and we have to work through that. But overall, we're getting our 
inspiration from God, from the well of life. And as we do, we have to give other people. I still bring her flowers. Not enough, I know. But it doesn't leave me off the hook in those areas. I, but, but she is most satisfied in God. Therefore, our marriage can become focused on the kingdom of God. And as a result, our marriage is much better, much deeper. Those are most ready for marriage are those that need it the least. If you're looking for marriage to be, bring that happiness, if you're married or unmarried, um, don't. Look to God. Back to the, the big picture of the Bible. What is God doing? He's focusing on redeeming people, restoring the kingdom of God. He's chosen to do this in context of relationships, and marriage is one of those relationships. At Crosspoint, we started, when we started, we knew that we wanted a church administration to focus on discipleship, all right? But, but it wasn't long. We talked about discipleship. We had discipleship groups. We pushed into the idea that people, real change in people comes as a result of connecting with each other and pointing us to Christ. But something was missing. And about four, three, four years into it, we recognized that our vision for discipleship was discipleship needed to be a way to get a much bigger vision happening. It couldn't, the goal couldn't be discipleship. And it's the same in our marriages. We needed to realize that discipleship needed to be a tool toward a much bigger vision. And now that vision is, is the, the great commission and the great commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. And then also the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We serve a sending God that, has, that is mission-focused on restoring and redeeming all people to him. We need good marriages. We need good families. We need stable families that can model to a dying world what good families should look like. But we dare not allow our families and our marriages to become consumers and idols. What is an idol? It's anything that takes away from God, from giving God the glory. It takes away energy from fulfilling the great commission and great commandment. I want you to have great marriages. Hear me say that. I want you to have church to have great, as a church to have great families. But I want to call you to something bigger than becoming a church that is a great church for families. In Psalms, Paul, uh, David talks about the, the man that is happy, that has his quiver full um, of arrows. Quivers are not meant to be put on the wall as your trophy. Bows are not meant to be put on your wall as a trophy. Bows are to be sending units for the, for the arrows. These are the tools for something bigger. We need our marriages to be great, but great because out of them flow missions. Out of them flows discipleship. True evangelical faith cannot lie sleeping. I pray that you will have a happy marriage, but I pray that your marriage will have a goal that is bigger than yourself, that you cannot accomplish alone. I pray that your marriage will be a base camp for something bigger. May you be like Paul. I have finished my course. I have run the race. Life is about bringing glory to God, loving God, and loving others, and making disciples. We do this in the context of relationships and in marriages. May we be people that have marriages that bring glory to him, not to ourselves.